Mr. Ray, I... I am recording now, so but please keep talking. <laughs> Don't be shy, Zerata. It's okay. Oh, getting a bit noisy out here with street cleaning something. I don't hear it. I think your headset is very good because it's filtering it out. Oh, good. I didn't hear anything. So, I mean, I say street cleaning. It's more like footpath cleaning. We have a walking path along the front of our house. Sure. Yeah. Oh, come on. I start the pressing the recording button and everybody stops talking. Well, you know. <laughs> <It's front. laughs> People don't want to just hear my voice all the time on these recordings, guys. <laughs> um, there's things I wanted to cover in today's session, but then the responsible part of me says I probably ought to create a lesson before Tuesday's class, so maybe we'll do that. <laughs> Which... I've got a question, Jeremy. Yeah, um, sure. I had to leave uh, before you finished that uh, code change yesterday. Did you, was that actually, did, did, do you want to recap on where we got to with waiting with uh, data loaders? Uh, probably not because you can just watch the video. And so like, otherwise I guess we're just doing it twice. So is it, so... Is it working now though? Yeah, yeah, it's all good. You know, okay. I mean, it's, uh, the concept is working correctly in terms of the code. Um, we didn't like get a better score, but I didn't particularly expect to either. Um, you know, maybe after next Tuesday's lesson, we will revisit it because I actually think the main thing it might be useful for is um, what's called curriculum learning, which is basically focusing on the hard bits. Um, looks like Nick's internet still isn't working, but Nick was saying the other day that yeah, he uh, looked at which ones we're having the errors on, which is like what, we've, which, what we look at in the book, um, like looking at the classification interpretation and looking at like plot top losses and stuff. And he said like, yeah, all the ones that we're making, that we're getting wrong are basically from the same one or two classes. So um, I haven't done much with curriculum learning in practice, like I like all it means in, in, in theory is that we use our weighted data loader to weight the ones that we're getting wrong higher. And um, whether that will actually give us a better result or not, I'm not sure. But that I think that's more likely to be a useful path than simply reweighting things to be more balanced. Because we don't want things to be more balanced because the ones that we observe the most often in the test set are actually the ones we want to be the best at, you know. Um, I will say I didn't check whether the distribution of the test set is the same as the training set. Uh, if it's randomly selected, then it will be. And if it's not, then that would be a reason to use a weighted data loader as well. Um, Yeah. Um, okay, so. What's the difference between, yeah. um, I guess like what's uh, the, is it is the curriculum learning kind of related to boosting and conceptually? Not really, so, I mean, maybe. So boosting is where you um, calculate the difference between the actuals and your predictions to get residuals. And then you create a model that tries to predict the residuals. And then you can add those two <coughs> predictions together, um, which is, if not done carefully, is a recipe for overfitting. Um, but if done carefully, can be very effective. Um, yeah, well, so we're, we're talking about something which is conceptually very different, which is saying like, oh, we're like really bad at recognizing this category. So let's show that category more often during training. Um, that's um, a good question. Um, yeah. I guess I'm really of uh, kind of focusing on examples you're getting it wrong, mm -hmm. like more kind mm -hmm. of conceptually doing something similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was just going to ask: Are the labels ever wrong, like by accident or intentionally of in Kaggle? Of course, absolutely. So, so oh, both intentionally as well. 
No, not intentionally. Okay. I mean, I mean, not normally. Like sometimes there might be a competition where they say like, oh, this is a synthetically generated data set and some of the data is right. wrong because we're trying to do something like what happens in practice, but we can't share the real data. But so is there no, any advantage in trying something like uh, some uncertainty values from something like MC dropout, try to find like a threshold of things that are too difficult and then potentially they're wrongly labeled. I'm, just I'm not sure you would need that. Like the thing we use in the book and the course is simply to um, find the things that we are <coughs> confident of, but we know we're wrong, but turn out to be wrong and then just Look at the pictures. So the raw soft true. max value is enough, you think, to, to basically know whether or not. I I, I do, yeah. I mean, that seems to work pretty well. I mean, the 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 only thing is, you would need to be able to recognize these things in photos. But I'm sure if you spent an hour reading on the internet about what these different diseases are and how they look, you would be able to pick it up fast soon enough. And then you know, just like we did in chapter two for recognizing the things that aren't black and brown teddy bears okay but so plausibly even just knocking out some of the extremely difficult examples might get you higher on the leaderboard purely by virtue of them misleading the model not by, not, not by knocking out the the hard ones but but by knocking out the wrong ones yes yep. um okay. unless the test set, unless the test set is mislabeled consistently with the training <laughs> set in which case you would not want to knock them out because you would want to be able to correctly predict the things which people are incorrectly recognizing as the wrong disease. Something to try there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I would do exactly what we did in chapter two. You know, you can use exactly the same widget. Um, but as I say, you'd have to probably spend an hour learning about rice disease, which probably be a reasonably interesting thing to do anyway. Uh, I just saw a link. Uh, uh, there's a discussion in the patty. Um, cool. Some people identified there's some mislabeling, at least over 20 already. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it definitely happened. It says, we have manually annotated every image with the help of agricultural experts, but there could be errors. Wow, this person knows more about rice than I do. I think yes. the images in the Tungro have class of issues. His symptoms can easily be confused with potassium deficiency. Fair enough. Is that an example of what you're talking about, where if, if a layman or sorry, if a semi-expert gets confused, then the labeling in the test set's probably the same. So you Yeah, exactly. So you're probably fixing these would probably screw up your model because assuming that the test set was labeled, used by the same people in the same way. I mean, sometimes test sets, the test set is more of a gold standard. They'll make more effort to talk to like a larger number of higher quality experts and have them vote or something. Um, Honestly, this competition seems like it doesn't even have any prize money attached. So I'd, like, I think it's really low, <clears throat> low investment probably. And so I doubt they did that, but, but that can happen. Yeah, that the test set could have. I mean, it makes sense to invest in getting really good labels for the test set, um, actually. I was looking at one of the other competitions on um, UNIFESP, the x-rays, and I think there there was one, somebody had identified that a, a wrist was wrongly labeled as a Is this a current one, like that. Brian? It, it's a, it's, yeah, it's not a, there's no money again, but it's been Hang running on, for a little it. while. What's it called? A UNIFESP, U-N-I-F-E-S-P. Uh, oh, right. It's another community competition. I Yeah. Gosh, it's not very popular. Why is there only 74 teams? Yeah, sorry, go on. No, I don't know. I just I was just looking around and it looked interesting. So I'm I'm number yeah. 15 at the moment. But good on you. But it is it is a slightly weird one because, well, it's it's interesting because some of the X-rays have multiple labels, but the labels are just concatenated. Uh -huh. So there's an interesting discussion on how you'd an analyze that. Would you treat a, a combination as a distinct classification, whether it was like a neck and a chest or something, or do you look at each of them individually and then try and label a multiple one from the different things? So, it's, um, okay. So, uh, I'm just having a look at this competition. So, when does it close? This is a month to go, but I don't know. 
exactly when that is. Um, normally it's there's July like July 31st. A, okay, where do you see that? When you go to, like to the bottom of like on the overview and it says there's a whole timeline. So then you yeah. can just hover over the-, the Oh my flow. God, I see. It says close in a month, but you actually have to get a tool tip by hovering. Okay, yeah. thanks Tanish. That's strange UX. Okay, so we've actually got more than a month. So maybe next week we could have a look at this one because it would be a good opportunity to play around with um, medical image stuff because they're using DICOM, I think. Yeah, the, somebody has also, which I used, supplied a, a library of PNGs, which made it easier to use, but I don't know what you lose in using that rather than the DICOM images. Well, it rather depends. Um, so DIC DICOM is a very generic um, file format that can contain lots of different things in it. But one of the things DICOM contain is, is higher bit depth images than a PNG allows. So if they've, um, yes, they, may, they might have gotten rid of that. Um, FastAI has a nice medical imaging, it's pretty small, but like has some useful stuff, medical imaging library, uh, which I think is fastai.vision.medical, uh, which can handle DICOM directly. Mm -hmm. And I see there's a fast AI entry as well. Oh, that'd be fun. We should yeah. try this next week. I see, and there's the PNGs. Yeah, I think the DICOMs come to about 27 gigabytes. Oh my God, okay. <laughs> so the, uh, the PNG was quite attractive from that point. Yeah, of so one thing that you can do with DICOM is to compress them, particularly using JPEG 2000, which is a really good compression. Um, but yeah, people often don't for some reason. Um, so probably the first thing I'd look at in that competition is to see, look at our DICOM and see, is it storing 16-bit data or not? And if it is, I would try to find a way to resave that without losing the extra information. which I think we've got examples of in our medical imaging tutorial. Right, I'll take a look at that. Um, all right, I'm gonna share my screen, even though I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm gonna to have to drop in a few minutes, but I'll, I'll catch the rest on the recording. All right. Thanks for this. Nice to see you. Yeah, you. Oh, by the way, I was looking at this, uh, Conf next paper. And gosh, everybody congratulates transformers on everything. Vision transformers bring new ideas like the Adam W optimizer. But guess who actually wrote the first thing saying we should always use the Adam W optimizer? That would be Silva in fast AI. I think that was years before vision transformers. Adam W. There we go, mid-2018. Um, I read that paper last night and uh -huh. I was just thinking like, um, they kind of talk about how all of these things were already there, right? Yeah. But they just rediscovered them like slightly larger um, uh, kernel size and things like that, which like begs the question, why is there no one just done like experiments to, in, you know, to, to just tweak these things together? I mean, it's- I mean, it's we years. do, but- nobody takes any notice because they're not <laughs> written in PDFs, you know? Is it, I mean, what, these benchmarks though, like- uh, the, the thing is that day. like a lot of researchers aren't good practitioners. So they just, they're not very good at training accurate neural networks and they don't know these tricks, you know? Um, and they don't hang out on Kaggle and learn about what actually works. And so, but then the thing is like, it's not always easy to publish. Like even if you did stick it into a PDF and submit it to Europe, there's no particular high likelihood that they're going to accept it because the field research-wise is very focused on theory results and you know things with lots of Greek letters in them. Um, Does that mean that the part of the problem is that the data sets, the benchmarks, are just too inaccessible to the average person? So there's no, like I a wouldn't say that. For ImageNet 1K. No, I wouldn't say that. The issue is, I think, the culture of research is not particularly interested in experimental results, you know? 
Um, okay. With my limited experience, I would say um, it's very hard to find reviewer as well, especially you have a very strong domain, not just um, wanting all the uh, um, sample data set you can find in open source. Mm. Uh, when you call domain and then a lot of um, peer reviewer, they're just not picking up to review it. Even we pay for the um, reviewer we use so people can get it for free. And mm -hmm. we take, take us three months just to find reviewer. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, so on the uh, topic of papers, when do you know when a paper is worth reading, given the situation? Um, I mean, it, it don't like until, I mean, I'm very fond of like papers that describe things which did very well in an actual competition, you know, that then, you know, this is something that actually predicts things accurately. Um, you know, you can get similar results if they've got a good, um, you know, just table of results. So generally speaking, I like things that actually have good results, particularly if they show like how long it took to train and how much data they trained on. Um, and yeah, so are they getting good results using less data and less time than you might expect from the same thing? Um, and yeah, I certainly wouldn't focus only on those that get good results on really big data sets. That's not necessarily more interesting. I'm very interested in things that show good results using transfer learning. So I look for things that are like practically useful. I don't train that much from random. So I'm very interested in things that do well on transfer learning. Um, also like look for people who you've liked their work before, you know, and, and in particular, that doesn't mean like always reading the latest papers. You know, if you come across a paper from somebody that you find useful, go back and look at their Google Scholar and look, read their older papers, um, and see who they collaborate with and read their papers. So for example, I really like Kwok Lee and Google Brain. Um, his, he, him and his team do a lot of good work. It tends to be, you know, very practical and high quality results. And um, so we know when his team releases a paper, I, and I also know like he seems to have similar interests to mine, like he tends to do stuff involving transfer learning and getting good results in less epochs and stuff like that. So if I see he's got a new paper out, I'm pretty likely to read it. I have a question. Um, in I mean, for for the the Kaggle competitions and like like in a lab type of environment is, uh, I mean, when to the question that I have is when to stop iterating on on a model on a model that that you have is is I have the someone asked me uh, when is enough enough to to do the training on the data that you have. Mm -hmm. When is enough? Mm -hmm. mm. So that question. I mean, um, there's some reason you're doing this work, right? So like you hopefully know when it does what you want it to do. Um, I mean, the, the thing that happens all the, uh, that happens, especially to me all the time is mm -hmm. that we train the model and it works perfectly fine on, on the, lab mm -hmm. when we're doing it and then as soon as we throw a couple of images that they are not part of the set mm -hmm. i mean that thing goes nuts and, and okay because so it doesn't that's have like... enough light or more light or the temperature okay. is different or stuff like that so, so that's uh, a different problem right so that, that that means your problem is that you're um you're not using um the you know the right data to train on. Um, so like you you need to you you need to be thinking about how you're going to deploy this thing when you train it. And if you train it with data that's different to you know how you're going to deploy it, it's not going to work. Um, yeah. So that's that's what that means. And um 
it might be difficult to get data, enough data of the kind you're going to deploy it on. But like at some point, you're going to be deploying this thing, which means by definition, you've got some way of getting that data you're going to deploy it with. So like do the exact thing you're going to use to deploy it, but don't deploy it, just capture that data um, until you've got some, some actual data from the actual environment you want to deploy the model in. Uh, you can also take advantage of semi-supervised learning techniques to then, you know, and transfer learning to maximize the amount of juice you get from that data that you've collected. Um, and finally, I'd say, like, let's say for medical imaging, like, okay, you want to deploy a model to like a new hospital, they've got a different brand of MRI machine you haven't seen before. Um, I would take advantage of fine tuning. You know, each time I deployed it to some different environment where things are a bit different, I would expect to have to go through a fine tuning process to <clears throat> train it to recognize that particular MRI machine's images. But, you know, each time you do that fine tuning, it, um, it shouldn't take very much data or very much time because it's, you've, your model's already learned the key features and you're just asking it to learn to recognize slightly different ways of seeing those features. Right. Yeah, I don't think you'll solve this by training for longer. You know, you'll solve it by figuring out your, um, your data pipeline, your data labeling and your rollout strategy. Usually the, the issues that we're having is that we don't have enough data of, of, of certain category, but I mean, the, the thing that you did yesterday uh, it resolves a little bit of that problem. I think we're gonna start using Yeah, well also problem. like, if you don't have enough data of some category, don't use the model for that category, you know? So like, um, at, at, you know, rather than using softmax, use binary sigmoid, you know, as your last layer. And so then you've kind of got like a probability that X appears in this image. And so then you can, you can recognize when none of the things that you can predict will appear in the image. And so um, then have a, um, you know, you always want a human in the loop anyway. So when you didn't find any of the categories of things that you've got enough data to be able to find, then, um, triage those to to human review mm -hmm. well uh, one thing that we did is uh, i mean we have like 50 something categories oh of, just one uh, moment hang on yes Sorry about that. Uh, we had like 50 categories and, and some of them are like, they have a lot, like 10 of them have a lot of items. Mm. So we end up doing like in a three-step kind of process, like the ones with a lot, the ones with medium number yeah. and the ones with a smaller number. And uh, it's, it looks like it resolved the problem a little, a little bit. Cool. But, but um, uh, this was to classify metadata coming from from other systems mm -hmm. and uh, classify it for legal purposes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for legal retention i see got it <clears throat> um tell me uh, yeah. i had a question actually uh, yesterday oh. you tried the weighted data loaders right so i think you haven't submitted that to kaggle notebook so did you do any validation locally first before submitting to Kaggle, uh, something like that, do you have a setup? Like? No, I mean, you saw what I did, right? And when I did it, so I just, yeah, I just, I, I like, I, I was intentionally using a very mechanistic approach. Um, Cause it was part of like, just, um, yeah, showing like his, the basic steps of pretty much any computer vision model, which is, entirely mechanical and doesn't require any domain expertise so yeah my question more was or like shouldn't we always treat the public leaderboard like as a good or like should we take a holdout 
local data sets for us to validate. I think yeah, so I, I, I mean, I always have a validation set. Yeah. Um, um, which we saw in this, in this, I just used a random splitter because as far as I know, the test set in the Kaggle competition is a randomly split validation set. Yeah, so like whether it be for Kaggle or anything, I think uh, creating a validation set that as closely as possible represents the, the data you expect to get in deployment or in your test set is really important. Um, and uh, yeah, I actually didn't spend the time doing that on this Paddy competition. Um, normally on Kaggle, if somebody does and notices there's a difference between the private leaderboard and the public leaderboard, like the test set and the training set, normally it'll appear in, a, in discussions or on a Kaggle kernel or something, um, which is partly why I didn't look into it. But yeah, I mean, you should probably check, does it have the same distribution of um, disease types, you know, from the predictions that you create? Um, do the images look similar? Do they have the same sizes? And for me, if I, as soon as I see any difference between the test set and the training set, that puts my alarm bells on, right? Because now I know that it's not randomly selected. And if you know it's not randomly selected, then you immediately have to think, okay, they're trying to trick us. <laughs> so <laughs> I would then look everything I could for differences. Because it takes effort to not randomly select a trait, a test set. So they, they must be doing it very intentionally for some reason. Quite often for wrong reasons, it turns out in practice. I think so. Like, I don't think a Kaggle competition should ever silently give you a systematically different test set. I think there's great reasons to create a systematically different test set, but there's never a reason not to tell people. So if it's like medical imaging, it's a different hospital, you should say this is a different hospital. Or if it's fishing, you should say these are different boats. Or, you know, because like you want people to do well on your data. So if you tell them, then they can use that information to give you better models. Um, and so, Korean, uh, like going back to what you asked about, there's this validation in training, then there's this uh, whether your local validation maps to what's happening on the leaderboard, the score on the hidden test set. But there's one other scenario that I encountered recently, and maybe it will be interesting to someone. When you're working on a competition, sometimes you might mess something in your code where the prediction, you know, your model is still doing something useful, but you're failing to output a correctly formatted submission file. And not in a sense that the submission fails on Kaggle, but some predictions are not aligned where there should be, or you know, they're for a different uh, uh, customer ID or, or stuff like that. So once you have one good uh, submission file, relatively good, you can just store it locally and then see, you know, run a check the correlation between your new submission and the one that you know that this okay. And you know, the correlation should be upwards of 0.9, and then you know, yeah, okay, so I didn't mess up anything with. Uh, the, the technical aspect of outputting the prediction. I mean, it, it's not a great trick, but uh, you know, I was like pulling my hair out. Why is this not working? It's a better model. So this was like a sanity check step. Maybe at some point it will be useful. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Um, all right. So. Let me share my screen. Uh, let's find Zoom. Zoom. Share screen. Yeah. Oh, that's not the right button. Control Alt Shift H. Uh, okay. Um, where did we get to in the last lesson? Um, we finished random forests, right? 
And oh, that's right. And I haven't posted that video yet. Um, that's okay. We can check the live. Fast AI live. Okay, so we did small models. And did we get to the end of this? Okay, so that basically, so we basically finished the second one uh, of of our Kaggle things. So next week, um, see what's in part three. Right, gradient accumulation. I think that's worth covering. So one thing that somebody pointed out on Kaggle is I've actually, I'm using gradient accumulation wrong. Um, I was passing in two here to mean, um, to make, create two batch, like do two batches before you accumulate. But actually what I'm meant to be putting in here is the kind of target batch size I want. So that would be actually, I should be putting 64 here. Um, so I feel a bit stupid. <laughs> so what I've been doing is I've been actually not using gradient equation at all, I guess. It's been doing a batch and saying that's over, uh, saying my, my maximum batch size should be two. Okay, so this has actually been not working at all. That's interesting. Whoops. So it's been using a batch size of 32 and not accumulating. Ha. Huh. Okay, so that's one thing to note. So when I get Kaggle GPU time again, we'll need to rerun this. Actually, it only took 4,000 seconds. Um, so I guess we should, we could just get it running right now, couldn't we? So, that should be 64. Gravity of pass defines how large the effective batch size you want is. over batches. Oh, we can just remove this sentence entirely. Oh no, that's right. Uh, we divide the batch size by some number based on how small we need it to be for our GPUs RAM. Okay. So And on Kaggle, I think these were all smaller. I don't know why, but the Kaggle GPUs use less memory than my GPU for some reason.
Okay. So we're now Let's try running it. So Jeremy, you would increase that Akum number until yeah. No longer get CUDA out of memory. Yeah, and you could be able to pretty much guess it by looking at like, I mean, you can just um, once you've found a batch size that fits, you know. Um, so the default batch size, I believe, is um, thirty-two. Um, so once you find a batch size that fits, sorry, sixty-four is the default. A batch size that fits, you just like it's like okay, well, if it fits in thirty-two, then I just need to set it to two because sixty-four divided by two is is enough. And um, the key thing I do here is, you know, so I've got this report GPU function. So what I did at home was I just, you know, changed this until it got less than 16 gig. Um, and as you can see, I'm just doing like a single epoch on small images. So this ran in, I don't know, 15 seconds or something. Um, Thank you. Yeah, batch size 64 by default. Um, yeah, so then I just went through checking the memory use of Confnex large with different image sizes. Again, just keeping on using just one epoch. And that's how I figured out what I needed to set the cum to for it to work. All right, so that should be right to save and run. And then Turn off this one. So when you're running something, like you click save version and you click run, you'll then see it down here. And um, that runs in the background. You don't have to leave this open. And so you can go back to it later. So if I just copy that and close it. And if I go to my notebook in Kaggle, Um, this shows me version three of four because version four hasn't finished running yet. So if I click here, I can go to version four and it says, oh, that's still running. Um, and I can see, here we go, it's been running for about a minute. And it shows me anything that you print out will appear, including warnings. So that's, yeah, that's what happens in Kaggle. Um, so if we also do the multi-objective loss function thing, that would be cool. Um, so I thought like next time in our next lesson, broadly speaking, um, gosh, this is taking a long time. Um, I kind of want to cover like what the inputs to a model look like and what the outputs to a model look like. Um, so like in terms of inputs, really the key thing is embeddings. Um, that's the key thing we haven't seen yet in terms of what model inputs look like. Um, for model outputs, I think we need to look at softmax. Um, outputs. Softmax, uh, cross entropy loss, entropy loss. Um, and then, you know, our multi target loss. 
um, which we could do first as a kind of a segue. Um, so maybe in terms of the ordering, the segue would be like doing multi-target loss first. And we could talk about softmax and cross entropy, which would then lead us potentially to like looking at the um, bear classifier. What if there's no bears? So we can just use the binary sigmoid. Um, so then for embeddings, I guess that's where we'd cover then collaborative filtering, collaborative filtering, because that's like a really nice version of embeddings. Um, so I guess the question is, for those who have done the course before, um, are there any other topics? I guess like time permitting, it would be nice to look at like the confnet, what a confnet is. Just kind of so that's like then we've got like the outputs, the inputs, and then the middle. <laughs> Um, what about more NLP stuff? I know people are interested. Like what? Well, I've heard that um, Hagen face is getting integrated with fast AI. Maybe looking at that, how it works. Well, it's not done yet, so <laughs> we can't do that yet, but definitely in part Maybe two. Um, I've got a question. I, I don't know if it's helpful, but um, there's a lot of emphasis on outputs and inputs. Um, but like in the middle, just understanding like the outputs of a, of a hidden layer, whether they're going awry or not, how do you kind of debug that? How do you understand, you know, when to, to kind of look at those? Yeah, very helpful. Um, last time we did a part two, we did a very deep dive into that. And I think we should do that again in our part two. Because like... Um, most people won't have to debug that because if you're using an off the shelf model, you know, like it's, you know, with off the shelf initializations, that shouldn't happen. Um, so it's probably more of an advanced debugging technique, I would say. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in looking at it now, definitely check out our previous part two um, because we did a very deep dive into that and developed the the so forth colorful dimension plot, which is absolutely great for that. Um, Jeremy? What about yeah. deep learning on tabular data? Have, yeah, uh, so that would, exactly. So collaborative filtering would lead us exactly into that. Thank you, tabular DL. Yeah, sorry, Serata. Um, do you mind to spend five minutes talking about the importance of the um, ethical side? Uh, at least you point to the resources um, Rachel prepared before. So I think mm. that will people, because it's so easy to build a model, but how to apply is getting more scary now. Mm. Yes. Yes, I mentioned in lesson one, the data ethics course, but you're right. It would be nice to kind of like touch on something there, wouldn't it? Mm. Um, lecture by Rachel from part one before. That was, that was a great lecture. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, okay, I mean, that actually would be a great thing just to talk about, you know, that that lecture is not at all out of date. So, yes. So maybe touch on it in this one mm -hmm. and also talk link to, you know, for, for varying levels of interest. Um, the two hour version would be Rachel's talk in the 2020 lecture and then deeper interest duel would be the, yes, the, the full ethics course. That's a great point. Thank you. So then um, for, for actually pretty much all of these things, um, we have Excel spreadsheets. Um, which is fun. So there's 
Let's have a look. Collaborative filtering. Oh, looks like I've already downloaded that. Huh. And Jeremy, I would encourage you to continue teaching in Excel. Um, yesterday, I on the panel in a data science conference and mm. When I mentioned I start with uh, Excel, actually inspire a lot of people. They want to have a go with data science and learning it. So oh, please, that's please good do. feedback. Please yeah, because there's a, certainly some people who don't find it useful at all, um, and they tend to be quite loud about <laughs> about it. So um, it's certainly nice to hear that that feedback. Um, What on earth? I thought you didn't oh. bother you, Jeremy. Sorry? So I thought you didn't let those people get to you. <laughs> oh, I only pretend that anybody doesn't get to me. <laughs> uh, I was going to back up, back up so I don't just say that's, that was really great to see. Um, I've only seen it done once before, um, and that was in a physicist in Belgium who explained radiative transfer modeling using Excel. And it was just so nice to see the clarity. Yeah, it was great. Keep doing. Great. Okay. Thank you. I will. Um, let's see. So we've got. Um, so I think these are actually from the 2019 course, Fast AI One courses, DL One. Uh, so I'm just going to grab them all. So one thing I don't think we're going to cover this year, this part one that we will cover in part two is like different optimizers, like momentum and Adam and stuff. But I think that's okay because I feel like nowadays just use the default Adam W and it works. So I don't, I think it's fine not to know too much more than that. It's a, uh, it's uh... A little bit of a technicality nowadays. In yeah. The sense like, you, like you mentioned, Jeremy. And it used to be something always... we did in one of the first lessons, you know, but um, that was when you kind of had to know it, right? Because you always fiddled around with momentum and blah, blah, blah. To, to me, uh, always like the biggest thing when starting on something is to how to read data. You know, once I figure out how to read in the data, then things. So uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that there's such an emphasis in this edition of the course on, on the reading you know, data. And you know, with tabular data, that is something that I will also stay on the lookout for, just understanding better how to read in the data. Great. I don't think we did this one anymore because we kind of have better versions in in Jupyter with IPy widgets. So we've got um, this fun convolutions example, which I think is still valuable. Um, okay, we've got softmax and cross entropy examples. And we've got collaborative filtering. That's something interesting. Wonder what that is. <laughs> and then also we've got word embeddings. All right. Embeddings are such a cool and important subject. Mm. And it's something that we haven't discussed that much in this course. No, I mean, we haven't touched them yeah. at all. Great. All right. Um, it feels like a lot to cover. Hmm. But we will, we will do our best. Okay. I think we're up to our hour. So thanks, everybody. Nice chat today. And I will get to work on putting this together. Have a nice weekend.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Just remind everyone, um, there's yep. a, a risk and bias um, video today. Um, I think six o'clock um, basement time. So with anyone interest, um, the guy mentioned, he Thomas mentioned he's going to have another US session as well. We, we can join. Just yes, I think there's details that. on the forum. Yeah. Thanks. See you.